class. This is going to be a class <laughs> on Zizek and ideology. Uh, if you hear my voice being a bit raw, it's because we were sitting mm. by a campfire yesterday <laughs> and my vocal cords have been smoked, like little smoked herrings. Um, thank you for joining us. If you would like to download the audio for this class and the lecture notes for this class, as well as the master class, and if you'd like to sub to our new subscription package, Woo-hoo. please go over to www.patreon.com dash Julian. Yes. That's www.patreon.com dash and Julian. Yes, and after this, I think we're going to have a clubhouse. So if you are on clubhouse, you can join us. And if you're a patron, you can also join us on Discord if you can't get the clubhouse app. That's right. <laughs> we're going to be hosting a seminar immediately after this. Uh, so it would be nice to have you for that. Mm-hmm. I'm going to run and grab coffee. Is Jenny so going to get some coffee? I'm, gonna, I'm going on the coffee round. Jenny's going to get us some <laughs> coffee. Okay, so if you... If this is the very first time that you are joining this class, welcome. It's wonderful to have you join our learning community. Every single class here is stand alone. So you can enjoy this class without any previous knowledge, without any education in philosophy or theory. However, this class is also part of a series. It's part of the series of the Introduction to Ideology series. And this is week seven. Now, you don't have to have seen weeks one, two, six. However, if you're interested in the themes that are discussed in this class, you can go back to those lectures. They're all saved on IGTV as well as on YouTube. Now, this project started at... Ah, here's Jenlene. <laughs> this project started about a year ago uh, when Jenlene and I started teaching free classes online. And we are committed to open access online global learning. Education should be free. Education should be informal, education should be online, and education should be global. It should be endless also. I mean, this <laughs> project this project like doesn't have, like, we have, you know, obviously a time period for a particular lecture and lecture series and themes and all that, but it's not like there's a point where you have to start or else you'll miss out, or a point, point that you have to... To listen through. And the reason that we can keep these class... I know, how did you get coffee so fast is what people are asking. Is because Jelly <laughs> pre-ordered the coffee. Yes, I have discovered ordering... Is that enough milk? Yeah, it's really fun, thanks. Ordering coffee on the app. So how do we that keep still these... takes forever. How do we keep these classes free and how do we keep them online for everybody? Well, the reason that they're free is that we have a small group of dedicated patrons. You a know who you are. A small but growing group. I know. Thank we're, you. We're yeah. currently at 77 patrons. We're trying to get to 100 patrons. What happens? When we reach 100 patrons, we are going to be releasing <laughs> our very own book, our very own Jenaline and Julian JXJ self-published little book. And we're trying to get to 100 patrons. We're currently at 77. Starts at five dollars a month, and it gets you access to our Discord. It gets you access to our clubhouse. Gives you lecture notes. Gives you audio downloads. You can find our <laughs> masterclass videos, and of course the subscription package that is going out this week, the JXJ <laughs> Studio package. Yes, so this is very the, excited This is the final that. plug for right now. <laughs> if you're a patient already, thank you. You are the one keeping the stream alive. You yes. are the one having, letting us have our classes 100% free yeah. for everybody. Mm-hmm. No payment required. Mm-hmm. And you are the guys and gals and, <laughs> and I don't know, whatever Students, the in-between is members, of that yes. who actually make up this learning community. So yeah. thank you very much. I'm going to take a sip of coffee and then I think we oh, should yes. just launch right in. Have a serious sip of coffee because Julian and I, we try to limit our coffee drinking to one particularly good cup mm. a day. And we get to share that cup of coffee with you on Mondays and Fridays because <clears throat> for every... Every Monday, we've been coming up here to have a coffee, and increasingly, we're doing Friday classes as well here. That's true. If you'd like to see Jenaline, by the way, you can go over to our YouTube, (laughs) where we film this in in landscape. (laughs) So we're also live on YouTube. Hello, everybody on YouTube. We see you. Okay, let's launch right in. Let's go for it. Zizek and ideology. Um... Or? So on a personal note, yes, I've always struggled with weekends. Mm. I find weekends a slightly abhorrent uh, thing. <laughs> uh, I think the expectation of weekends is hard. Yeah. And for me, the weekend is the part of the week when you're supposed to relax so that you can go back to work during the week. That's the idea of sort of the work week. 
And at the same time, it's like with a birthday. It's when you have an expectation for what your birthday ought to be, mm -hmm. it becomes very hard to enjoy your birthday. <laughs> and so I've always struggled with the idea of weekends. And Jenny and I have something that we call the Sunday blues, mm -hmm. which is that if we're going to have mental health issues, it's usually on a Sunday. <laughs> and and the reason that I want to start with that, uh, and you know, Monday gets a bad rap. People really say, oh, I hate Mondays. I have to go back to work, etc. But like, I love Mondays. For me, every Monday is a redemption. Every <laughs> Monday is a small personal salvation. It's a fresh start. From the, it's a fresh start and from the personal hell that is the weekend. <laughs> no, no, but I mean like that is, and I know that sounds really ungrateful, but like I genuinely love my work so much mm -hmm. that weekends can be very difficult. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason I'm bringing this up isn't just to vent, but it's also to say that the, in philosophy, the primary problem of philosophy the, the key issue and the key problem of all philosophy is ultimately the question of self mm. and is the question of you. And it is what do you do with your life? What is the ethical prerogative of being you and being part of a world and being part of a world that contains other people? And this is something that there is no clear answer to. This has to be navigated every single day. Mm. And so one of the things that Jenlene and I talk about a lot in these classes is that teaching and learning together is a way of navigating the problem of you with other people. Well, and it's also to give you vocabulary and a framework for how to grapple with those problems. Because I think sometimes those struggles can feel very isolating. And that is, I think, one of the challenges um, for maintaining your mental health is that it can feel really isolating when you're going through a difficult period and you feel like you're alone in that. And I think once you recognize that you're not alone in that and that there are you know, not only, you know, support networks and things like that and institutions available for help, but also these problems are not necessarily unique to you. They have been, they are the basis of philosophy and other disciplines, you know, psychology, etc. that really do provide a framework to help you think through them and talk about them and communicate them and express them. And that's a really important journey. And we don't think that that should be limited to philosophy students or to sociology students. We think that that should be available for everyone. Yeah, no, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, philosophy is not something you choose. Philosophy is something that <laughs> happens to you. In the same way, philosophy is not a noun, but philosophy is a verb, right? It is the love of wisdom. It's the process that you have your whole life, which is the process of navigating mm -hmm. your own being within the world mm -hmm. and a finite world for mm -hmm. many, of course. Mm -hmm. um, now, on that note, and we can come back to that a little bit, is sort of the question of why we teach. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons why we teach is because I had this, uh, there's this Prince story, hmm. Prince anecdote that I quite like. Prince, the, probably not the, the rock artist star, formerly known as. Art of form, <laughs> artist formerly known as Prince, exactly. And uh, Prince was asked why he, you know, why he did all these shows. Because for mm -hmm. a while he was relentlessly touring. Mm -hmm. And Prince said that he knows that there is always one kid in the audience who felt like they did not have access to something. Hmm. And that being in that concert, there's always that one kid who's going to have their world completely changed. <laughs> They're just going to see things differently from that day on. And the reason that Prince knows there's that one kid is because Prince was that one kid. And so all sharing, whether it's sharing of music or sharing of knowledge, has to start with that auto-referential mm. notion, which mm -hmm. is that I was that kid. Yeah. And I trust that that kid is also out there. It's finding mm -hmm. that, and this is really important for me, I think, when it comes to all teaching, is that... You have to find that universal thing. Mm -hmm. And it's it can be very embarrassing because if you if you talk about your own experience as being universal, yeah. every once in a while other people go, wait, what? <laughs> I don't experience that. And that can be really embarrassing. I think mm -hmm. authors write about this mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. But by and large, if you are going through something and you think nobody else is, that is exactly the thing other people are going through. <laughs> the flip side of it, of course, is when you are a student and you're trying to write a research paper and you finally think that you've stumbled across an original idea, I can guarantee you that someone has already written about that idea. Like finding an original idea is very, very difficult. And it's not necessarily the objective of academic engagement. It's synthesis. And that is something that is sometimes, I think, a really, really difficult mm difficult way to approach it. It's not about finding something new. It's about finding a new perspective on existing experiences or phenomenon or ideas. And you do that by using existing 
existing work, but it, it's the synthesis that's original, if that makes sense. Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I want to sort of start this lecture off, yeah. uh, but also to just let you know that if you are out there and you're having a hard time, you're not the only person, and that that mm -hmm. is what it means to be human, and mm -hmm. that we we have that too yeah. sometimes. Um, and that and that your passions and that your knowledge and your sensitivity and your insight are things that uh, don't go unnoticed, even if you think that they do. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, relating to that, I don't know if you've ever watched Star Trek, mm -hmm. but there's a there's an episode of Star Trek of the old original series mm -hmm. where I don't know who it is. I think it's like uh, I don't know Spock or something or wh whoever the captain is. What's his name? Doesn't really matter. Kirk. Kirk. And uh, there's like a distress signal, like mm. there's like a like a distress signal coming yeah. in. And he leans over and he says, these are the three most beautiful words in the human language, mm. in the English language. Mm -hmm. These are, I mean, they say human language because mm -hmm. these are the three most beautiful words in the human language. Mm -hmm. And you would think it's going to be like this cliche, Americanism, Hollywood, which is like, what are the three most beautiful words? I don't know. What would come to mind from like a Hollywood perspective? <laughs> I don't know. A happily ever after. Like... I don't know. I love you, right? I love you. Yeah, yeah. I love you would most people say, like, <laughs> I love you. Like, broadcasting, intergalactic, <laughs> I love you. Um, but no, the three most beautiful words in the galaxy, according to Kirk, are I need help. Mm. And broadcasting I need help is actually the precondition for human experience mm. and human autonomy, actually, believe it or not, is mm -hmm. the willing to be subject to others. Mm. And that's the ethos that, that underlies Star Trek is the same ethos that underlies our teaching which is that if you need help, we hope that you find help in this. Mm -hmm. Okay, let us begin. Hmm. Um, speaking of help, yes. by the way, do you know what the, uh, etym I think this is the etymology of help, mm. which is that I think it comes from the Greek elpis. Hmm. I'll tell you in a moment what elpis means. E-L-P. E-L-P-I-S. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'll tell you what that means in a moment. Um, so we're going to talk about naming. Mm. The, the title for this class is What's in a Name, mm. essentially. Mm -hmm. And there are certain names that contain the whole story of who that person is in a name. This is like one of those popular things <laughs> within Greek mythology. Mm -hmm. And a really good example of that is if you think about um, Pandora's box. Uh, do you know what Pandora means in Greek? You probably Pan sort of guess it. So, all. Yeah, Pan is all, exactly. Dora. Dora, North like Dora North the Explorer. Explorer. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> uh, yeah, Dora no. means giving or gifts. Hmm. And so Pandora, Pandora means the girl with all the gifts. Hmm. Uh, you've actually probably seen a zombie. You and I saw a zombie, zombie movie, movie called The Girl with All the Gifts. <laughs> and the, the zombie movie, the I mean, it's not a zombie movie as such, but it's one of those dystopian, the world mm -hmm. gets overtaken movies. And the title of that film, The Girl with All the Gifts, is a reference to Pandora's box in that sense. Hmm. By the way, while we're on Pandora's box, you should know that it is not actually, it wasn't a box. Um, it was actually an urn or a jar. And I think it was Erasmus who mistranslated it into <laughs> box. And so we all use the idea of Pandora's box. And even like in the graphic novel depictions where children learn like the classics. So it's, it's a like box. a little treasure chest but that it, flips open. Exactly. Yeah. But it's not so much a box as it is like an urn or like a bottle or something. Mm. Which makes sense because and how amphora, that's so Greek. Yeah, yeah. How often do you see the ancient Greeks walking around with boxes? Like that's just not really a thing. You know what I mean? Like I guess in the age of Amazon, the idea of a box makes more sense. But I feel like Pandora's amphora has sort of a nice ring to it actually. Pandora's amphora. I like that. Yeah. Maybe we should create a subscription service called Pandora's amphora. <laughs> Um, and so, in a sense, we have here a name that contains the entire story of Pandora's <laughs> urn or box, mm -hmm. which is that she's the girl with all the gifts. She is the one who has the power over everything that is in this box. And I'm not going to rehash the story, but of course, as you probably know, it's one of the most universal mm -hmm. legends and myths that we have, <laughs> is that when she opens this urn, she releases all the horrors of suffering and greed and malice and envy out into the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and in her struggle to put the lid back on, she retains one entity mm -hmm. in the urn. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that, the one little hapless flying little creature that is left in the urn is Elpis. Mm -hmm. In other words, it is hope. Mm -hmm. Pandora retains hope within the jar. And hope, in this case, relates to help. Hope is that which persists. And hope doesn't live in a vacuum. Hope exists because of the experience of loss and anguish and anxiety and mourning. And so the experience of being in the world 
is not just the experience of pleasure. It's not just the experience of joy or the experience of optimism. It's specifically holding on to hope because the premise and the problem of human subjectivity can sometimes seem an infathomable difficult charge mm -hmm. and and we were talking earlier about the existentialists and about Adorno and the idea that subjectivity is a predicament mm -hmm. being in the world as wonderful as it is and as enriching as mm -hmm. it is and as deeply deeply rewarding as it is is ultimately a predicative we are all tightrope walkers mm -hmm. and hope is one of those things that doesn't come separated from all the bad but it comes amidst all the bad and that's something that mm -hmm, I want mm -hmm. us to keep in mind here. Mm -hmm. Now, if you've, if you've joined these classes before, you know that in my style of teaching, week seven is the nodal point. Mm -hmm. This is, the, this is the, uh, the point that stitches it all together. So if we have 12 weeks of classes in the Intro to Ideology series, week seven is the uh, quilting point, or it's the carpenter's button that mm -hmm. holds up the fabric of these lectures. Mm. That's Keystone. Or a keystone, you could say, yes. Uh, now, the reason that I'm referring to the idea of a quilting point mm -hmm. is, and if you want me to say it in French, <laughs> it's the oh, please. point de capiton, <laughs> which is the Lacanian term for this idea. Mm. And so what we're going to do in this class is we're going to relate Zizek's theory of ideology to the Lacanian notion of the quilting point. And Lacan, you probably know or don't know, uh, is Jacques Lacan who is a, probably one of the most well-known French psychoanalysts, who's also a structuralist and very much a, a radicalizer and continuation of the Freudian school of psychoanalysis. I think this, this is something we've talked about plenty, yeah. right? Okay. <laughs> so we basically have the two main thinkers for this class. It's going to be Zizek on the one hand, and we're going to have Lacan on the other. Yes. Make sense? Yeah. So I want to talk about naming a bit, right? Because mm. we're talking about name. We had this mm. idea of Pandora. And that Pandora's name contains, in a sense, her destiny, as it were, right? And there's something about naming that I think is really important, which is that names can see, names are, in a sense, shockingly arbitrary. It's really hard to choose a name, for example, for a child. Mm. Uh, you and I have known couples who have children. We know couples mm -hmm, who have children. Mm -hmm. And we've heard snippets of their process in choosing names. <laughs> and one of the problems is that choosing a name is not only arbitrary, but it's also, it's a little bit like choosing clothing. Mm -hmm. Like there's a fashion mm -hmm. to names and mm -hmm. you can date when people were born more or less according to what name they have. Well, and I think there's also for some couples an anxiety about choosing a name in terms of will it bring, if it, is it unlucky to consider naming a child before the child has been born? Right. But it's sort of unavoidable to think about the name of the child, yeah. especially once you know you know, more, as you know more about the baby. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, the, the, na the name is important. Uh, and, and more importantly, the name is important to the child <laughs> because the child learns self-recognition <laughs> through the idea of being <laughs> named. One of the first things that you have as a child is the identity of a name. And it's even just the, the vocal sound of your name being pronounced and associated with you. And when your name is pronounced lovingly, that creates a certain <laughs> mental association. If mm -hmm. your name is used in a pejorative sense or in a stern sense. Um, when I was a child in the United States, if our teacher was angry with us, they would always say Mr. or Mrs. and followed by our last name. <laughs> so you knew you were in trouble if they didn't use your first name. Do you see what I mean? Yes. And so that was one of those things, like you start associating your last mm -hmm. name with a certain formality or a certain, like you've mm -hmm. done something wrong. Mm -hmm. So the process of naming is difficult. But this isn't just true for human beings, and it's not just true for animals. I mean, mm. the most naming you may do is like the naming <laughs> of a pet, for example. Everything has a name. Everything has to be named at some point. It's not just that human beings have names. It's that your coffee has a name, and your car has a name, and the name car then has a brand name, mm -hmm. etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We create meaning in the world through naming and through the association that we have with names. And a big part of being born into this world is learning how to name things and what name mm -hmm. to give things. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, I think you have an example of this where as a child, you referred to all birds as chickens. Yes, because I'd only ever seen chickens. And I grew up with chickens, feeding chickens. And my parents took me to the seaside where I saw a white bird that 
I thought was a chicken and perhaps, you know, if I threw sand at it, it was interested in eating the sand. I thought that was totally reasonable. Yeah. But no, evidently not. No, no, but, <laughs> no, no, but you're, yeah. you're doing exactly what you should, which mm-hmm. is that you've been given a certain framework, mm-hmm. um, linguistic framework. Right. Here's what things are. Here's what they're called. Mm-hmm. And you're using your own creative learning mm-hmm. to apply that to other things that should fit that category. And actually the seaside, it's interesting that you mentioned the seaside here because for many people, the seaside is where they first make that categorical error. Mm. Because when you're born, you don't, unless you're born in like Hawaii or something, you don't tend to go to the seaside. It's sort of a hassle. Sand gets everywhere. (laughs) The car gets dirty. Like it's a a trip for most people. And uh, for example, in my family, the version of that story is that my sister, uh, she knew that salad was leafy greens. Mm -hmm. And so when we went to the beach and she saw all the uh, seaweed, seaweed. Yeah. she referred for years to seaweed as salad <laughs> because it was that same. For you, chicken is a bird. For mm-hmm. her, greens were salad. Right. Because it's a problem not just of naming, but also of categories. Exactly. Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. absolutely a problem of categories. And this is where um, we can make the theological leap, if you will, to also naming in paradise, mm. which is that part of the... Yeah. <laughs> self-recognition of Adam and Eve and the eating of the tr- tree and fruit and knowledge, unless mm-hmm. I'm misremembering this, no, you're right. is the naming of the animals and yep. the giving a name to the world and classifying the world. And by means of naming the world, creating a taxonomy of beings, where does something fit? Where does something not fit? In other words, naming is the introduction of a certain difference into the world. And the reason that I want you to understand this is that when we talk about identity, which was key to the previous lecture, is that identity comes into the world at the exact same time that difference comes into the world. That identity precludes a certain difference and that difference precludes identity. In the same way that hope comes into the world as part of the experience of hopelessness. Mm. Hope emerges at that point where you feel like you cannot go on. Mm -hmm. And so identity emerges at that point in which what is a world of difference has been created, right? As were. I don't mm-hmm, mean to be like too mm-hmm, uh, no, pedantic here, mm-hmm. but the relationship between identity and difference is here, strictly speaking, dialectical. It's mediated. It's something we're going to talk about in the next class as well. Mm-hmm, we're going mm-hmm. to talk a little bit more about difference within uh, deconstructionism and Derrida and all that stuff. So when we're naming, we're, we're active agents in finding ourselves in the world. And also thinking about how the world is, in a sense, arbitrary. Because when you start realizing that things have names, you start asking yourself, why does it have that name? Mm -hmm. And um, it's interesting because one of the things that a child will often ask is, uh, is the, like, why question. (laughs) And when you have a child, they go through a phase, the existential phase. Because most children, this is sort of how it goes. I mean, I'm I'm being a bit silly here, but most children, they're born. Mm -hmm. And then they just try to kill themselves as quickly as they can. <laughs> like, young children are just in the constant process of like, okay, the limits. I've seen life, I'm out. I'm going to fall down the stairs, I'm going to put my finger into a socket. I don't know, anything they can do, like, you have to be around them all the time because yeah. they will just, they have like no... I'm going to eat everything. Exactly, they'll just try to kill themselves, basically. <laughs> now, it's wrong of me if, where I say I'm being silly is you cannot infer that there's a self-destructive <laughs> intention here, uh, but that's how it feels from the perspective of a parent, <laughs> which is perfect because, of course, then for the parent, it also uh, it also triggers the parental instincts, mm-hmm. right? So it kind of works. And then, there's, then that's sort of okay, but then the next stage is a little bit annoying, which is when the child starts questioning everything. Why is this? Why is that? Why is that? Like, constantly. Mm -hmm. And what's funny about that is, to function in the world, you have to stop asking yourself why. Right? And this, again, I said this so many times in this class, but the (laughs) role of the psychoanalyst (laughs) is to induce hysteria into the psychotic subject, a form of questioning. (laughs) And so, what happens for a child is that they're constantly questioning everything. They become hysterical, Mm -hmm. in a sense. They're Mm -hmm. just questioning, questioning, questioning. And to go back to psychoanalysis here, like there's actually the psychoanalytic uh, definition of psychosis is when the sign, uh, sorry, when the signifier and the signified are totally separate. If you if you want to go back to what is the sign and the signifier and the signified, you can find that in my masterclass series where I did a whole video breaking down those definitions. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not going to rehash that there. But for the psychotic, those are separate. The signifier and the signified are separate. Mm-hmm. And for the hysteric, 
the relationship between the signifier and the signified is constantly being questioned. Mm. And that's exactly what a child does and why a child is in, in that sense hysterical. Mm. Because the child is constantly saying, why is it called that? Mm -hmm. Why does it do that? Like, you're suddenly realizing that there's all these relationships of meaning. It's trying to understand the system of meaning. Exactly. Yeah. And what the parent will do, and of course what the parent has to do at that point, is say, well, because. Mm -hmm. It is. Mm -hmm. It is that. <laughs> and, and what's interesting here is that the words it is, from a Lacanian perspective, is the introduction of the big other. That is the big other. <laughs> we have said it simply is. There is some kind of unspoken agency that makes it thus. Mm -hmm. It is unquestionable. You, a child, are questioning all these things. But at a certain point, you say, well, that's just how it is. And the introduction of it is is the introduction for the very first time, not only of the big other, of that unspoken, non-existing entity that somehow justifies the status quo. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what's important here about the status quo is like, the status quo is not static. Mm, that's a good point. The status quo is always changing. Mm -hmm. The status quo doesn't remain the same. Something that was acceptable 100 years ago is no longer acceptable today. Mm -hmm. The it is is constantly changing and is constantly in flux and part of being an active citizen in the world is that you're giving meaning to that. Mm -hmm. And so what we're finding here is that the it is, the status quo, isn't something that exists naturally in the world on which we build our existence, mm -hmm. but it is something that comes together retroactively. It comes together through retroactive, contingent, in other words, accidental meaning. And all naming is retroactive. For example, what makes you genuine? Mm. What makes you genuine is that you were named genuine, mm -hmm. and so you associated yourself with the name genuine. Right. And now you truly are genuine. <laughs> and if you, which is a, mm -hmm. it's a curious name first of all, but <laughs> if you were called, I don't know, Elizabeth. Mm -hmm you would probably be an Elizabeth now. <laughs> you can change yeah. your name, of course. Mm -hmm. We can legally change our names mm -hmm. or we can informally change our names. For example, you know me as Julian. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say, ah, my name is actually <laughs> Gilroy <laughs> McDuffin. Uh, that's, not, that's not the case. Um, but my name, Julian, is actually pronounced in German because my mother is German. So <laughs> she would want me to be called Julian which is how the Germans pronounce Julian. Mm -hmm. If you go to Portugal, they'll say Julian mm -hmm. or Julian. Mm -hmm. um, and I, at a certain age, started calling myself Julian mm -hmm. because I didn't want to be called Julian. Mm -hmm. Now, why did I not want to be called Julian? It's because I moved to Holland. And in Holland, if they try to pronounce the German version mm -hmm. of Julian, they say Julian. And I thought that the name Julian sounded so dumb <laughs> that I didn't want to become Julian. <clears throat> Julian I was okay with, but <laughs> Julian, I thought like, it's That's like, a too far. there's something floppy about that. Like I just imagined like some kind of like <laughs> caricature of myself. And so you go into another country and people start pronouncing your name differently. You may have experienced this, that if you are in another country <laughs> mm -hmm. and everybody pronounces your name in what to you seems like the wrong way, mm -hmm. you are powerless. Mm -hmm. That will become who you are. And so at that point, I, as a teenager, I specifically started calling myself Julian mm -hmm. because then the Dutch would try to emulate the English and they would say Julien, which sounds like the French. I'm okay <laughs> with that. And so there's a certain amount yeah. of like leeway there that you can use to flex your mm -hmm. identity and your name. But you know, a name can be a blessing and a curse in many ways. There are people who want to get rid of their name or who disavow their name or mm -hmm. change their name. Like, naming is a symbolically, psychologically very difficult thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is, again, like the personal name. Mm -hmm. But, but that, that retroactivity is true for all naming. Like, as much as I like etymology, because it gives you the sensation of treasure hunting mm -hmm. for the meaning and the origin of a word, at the end of the day, words are arbitrary. They don't have any meaning in and of themselves. And there are certain words that are so fantastical that they almost make us aware of the sense that they don't have a meaning in and of themselves. Like there are certain, certain words that I don't know if I can come up with anything. Like strictly speaking, any word, if you repeat it, you probably notice that if you repeat any word often enough, 
you will lose the material tactile sense of that word. For example, if you take the word, I don't know, um, I don't know, uh, I don't, pff, trampoline, <laughs> and you say trampoline, 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 and you go on and on and on, <laughs> you lose the mental image of trampoline at that point. It just become like uh, an, a, like a guttural explanation. Mm -hmm. And there's something very abysmal about losing that, that fixed point. Now, why am I talking about all this stuff that everybody already, already knows? The reason, I'm also going to sneeze, by the way, I think. <laughs> That's okay. Like, got a little right. <laughs> and the sun's coming out. Bless you. <laughs> For those of you listening on the audio, I'm sorry. Bless me. Excuse me. Bless you. <laughs> Gesundheit. Um, so the reason I'm talking about naming here uh, it's not just to point out that names are contingent and arbitrary, that, you know, that's a pseudo wisdom, basically. What I'm trying to point out here is that there is no essence to the idea of name. And that when something is given a name, we create meaning and identity around that name, mm -hmm. even though the name is strictly speaking supplemental and excessive. There is no core of my being that makes me a Julian. There's no core of your being that makes you a gentleman. Mm -hmm. And so what happens there is that my idea of being Julian, right, becomes what it means to live the life of being me. But could I live without a name? Mm -hmm. Yes. The answer would seem to be yes, you could live without a name. But the problem is you, your designation of yourself needs some form of signification. So even if you don't have a name, your name would be the name of no name. And if you go back, for example, to immigrants who were coming to the United States or even to Holland, other countries from 200 years ago, there were people who didn't have a birthright, a birth certificate, or they mm -hmm. didn't have a name, or they didn't even know who their name was because they were an orphan. Mm -hmm. And uh, for example, in Holland, there is a, it's sort of a joke, but it actually existed. There's a last name, which is Nachtgeboren. Mm. And Nachtgeboren just means born naked. <laughs> and so if they didn't know who your family was mm -hmm. and you were an orphan, mm -hmm. the state would just say that you were born naked. <laughs> because that's the thing, like, the one thing everybody knows is like, okay, you were presumably born naked. You know what I mean? Yeah, and family names are a relatively modern concept anyway. Right. So, yeah, yeah I mean, it's usually an artifact of the state. Yeah, I mean, it's quite interesting. I don't want to do a whole thing on names. Yeah, yeah. Like, um... Like, uh, my name is very, my last name is very, very long, for example. I, I haven't shared it here, but it's one of those, like, six-piece <laughs> last names. And it's a Portuguese last name, so it's like, uh, in Lord of the Rings, it's like a family tree, <laughs> essentially. But I want to go back to that retroactive, contingent mm -hmm. nature of all naming, which is really important to mm -hmm. me. Because, remember, the two thinkers we're going to talk about here are Zizek and Lacan. And Lacan has this idea of the nodal point on which meaning is hinged. And the way that Lacan talks about this is he says that to be alive is to be stuck in an infinite chain of signification, of signifiers. So for example, we had the example of you mm -hmm. as a linguistic idea. Mm -hmm. you, and, and what's important to note here is that Lacan is a structuralist, and what that means specifically is that he's taking so Syrian linguistics, again, which I taught, which I teach in the master class. So if you want to access the master class, please head over to our Patreon. There you can find the definitions and the breakdowns. Mm -hmm. One of the nice things in in these classes, we don't have to go over all the definitions mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the the summarized versions, including the concepts for this class, are in the lecture notes and in the master class videos. So you can find those. We're not going to do a PowerPoint. No, we're not going to do PowerPoint. <laughs> so if you want those, you can go to www.patreon.com. That's <laughs> Jenlene and Julian. <laughs> I like how you're interrupting my. Uh, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. That is the little ad break here. But and so, Lacan says that we're swimming in a sea of signification. Everything has a name. Everything has meaning. Everything's associated with something. Something. And from the earliest stage of the mirror stage, you've come to recognize yourself as an other, essentially. You recognize that you exist to others, and your concept of self derives from the awareness that you are a self conscious being, that you live in the eyes and experience of other people. Mm -hmm. Again, when we go back, and there's an existentialist current here too, like. We talked about Sartre's expression uh, from, what is it, no exit, hell mm -hmm. is other people. Mm -hmm. 
And he's not saying that it's hell to be with other people. What is hell is that we don't exist without knowing that other people exist. Yeah. Our sense of self is predicated on the awareness that we, who appear to ourselves as autonomous beings, are actually reflected to others. And we cannot, no matter how much we try, shed that part of ourselves. Mm -hmm. We cannot be fully unself-aware because self-awareness is the condition of being. And this is where existentialists, in a sense, are also going against or expanding the Cartesian subject for cogito, the I think, therefore I am. It's not just that you are a self-reflective being. It's not just that you have transparency towards yourself. It's that the condition of realizing that you are a person mm -hmm. is the awareness that you are also a person to others mm -hmm. and that nobody will ever fully understand you. And the part of being misunderstood by others is the condition for the experience of the understanding of ourselves. Mm -hmm. That is the existentialist expansion of the cogito, of the Descartian or the Cartesian subject. And Lacan is in a sense in the same frame of thought. Lacan is thinking we only discover ourselves in the moment that we realize that there exists a reflection of ourselves. Perhaps Lacan's most readable and most important work is the idea of the mirror stage. If you go to the reader of on ideology that we put in the lecture notes, you can actually find that essay contained in the ideology reader. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to do a whole mirror stage thing here, mm -hmm. but and so we exist in this world, which is a world of what he calls the signifying chain. And it starts with that moment where you realize I'm in the world because I'm mirrored through other people and through myself and that I navigate the world by understanding what things are called and what things mean and why a chicken is not the same as a seagull. And as you get older, you become so comfortable in the world in that sense that you no longer question that. But it's uh, the world is a very complicated place, in a sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a truism. Mm -hmm. But So there's basically an endless chain of signification. Yeah. But Lacan's innovation is to say that there has to be a point at which the chain of signification stops. And that point is arbitrary. And it's not so much a keystone, as you suggested earlier, because a keystone is what exists in the middle of the... What sort is of it? holding Art. everything up. Holding everything up. And to that extent, it is like a keystone. Mm. But it's not an integral part of the signifying mm. chain. It's okay. actually external. It's supplemental. It's symptomatic, if you want to use the Freudian distinction. And uh, this is something that I'm going to do in the master classes. One of Zizek's arguments is about what is the relationship of the symptom between Freud and Marx. Mm. And did Marx actually invent the symptoms? So if you're curious about the masterclass for this week, mm -hmm. and it's going to be on the question, did Marx invent the Freudian symptom? <laughs> which is one of Zizek's main arguments in the beginning of his book, The Sublime Object of Ideology. And if you want to learn about that, you can go again to <laughs> www.patreon.com dash Julian, where I will be uploading the masterclass this week. Yes. And so, so for Lacan, there's this endless chain of signification mm -hmm. that has to have an external, supplemental, arbitrary, contingent, accidental point at which it is tied together, at which it comes to a stop. Mm -hmm. And that point is what he calls the point, the capiton. It is the quilting point. And Zizek uses that to say that what ideology is, is ideology is not brainwashing. Ideology is not political ideology. Ideology is the process by which the arbitrary, contingent, fixed, nodal point, the point de capiton, mm -hmm. comes to appear as the natural essence or embodiment of that which is foreclosing. So when you have a floating signifier and a signifying chain of meaning and equivalences in the world, mm -hmm. 
on which you base your identity and experience and your communication, there is that one thing that fixes its meaning. The it is point. Mm. Because. Mm -hmm. And that part is taken as the whole. As more true than the floating part. Mm. Now, this is very abstract, so we're going to start filling that in. But does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll start filling the blanks (laughs) a little bit. Um, (coughs) You know, (coughs) the thing is here. Names by themselves don't have as much power as we think they do. A good example of this is in the... uh, well, a good example of the opposite of that, I suppose, is the in legends, we have this idea that if you know the true name of something, like the mm-hmm. true name of a demon or mm-hmm. Mephistopheles mm-hmm. or something, mm-hmm. that you control them. That mm-hmm. To know somebody's name is a form of control. Mm-hmm. Um, and, of course, that already implies the power of naming and the power of the true name. Mm-hmm. But there's a moment here in the Batman versus Superman film that kind of like belies the vacuity of this argument. Mm. Of course, it's an appealing argument, but what's interesting is that there's a, I I don't know if you remember this, there's a plot point, spoilers for (laughs) Batman versus Superman. There's a plot point where we finally, it's sort of King Kong and Godzilla, right? Mm. The whole point of this film is to take two superhuman beings and to have them fight. Mm -hmm. It's it's wrestling, basically, (laughs) right? It's like, are you on Batman's side or Superman's side? It's a relatively simple premise. Yeah, someone in the YouTube comments already knows. And so they're having this battle, and Mm -hmm. it's a battle that, in a sense, can't be stopped. It's Mm -hmm. that, you know, unstoppable force meeting an immovable object, (laughs) Mm -hmm. uh, which was already popularized in the Christopher Nolan Batman Joker thing. Mm -hmm. And so they're they're facing off, and they're fighting. It's sort of the, the key set piece of the film. And they have a moment of ideological recognition Hmm. where they recognize something about themselves which suddenly drains the entire encounter of the meaning and the motives and the incentive for fighting. Now, in a sense, this is true for all fights. They don't have a core. Hmm. Uh, and, And this is true for even the worst most meaningful intergenerational fights like the Israel-Palestine conflict. It's, and one of the mistakes that people in peacekeeping have, and I used to teach actually peace and conflict theory, is most people go on the hunt for that one thing that is the core of the disagreement. Yeah. The thing that if you can fix the this thing... Yeah. The primary contestation. The primary contestation, uh, the knot in the back of the tortured person, whatever. Like, it's Mm -hmm. that thing that if you can wring it out of something or somebody, it'll be gone. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't exist. That is an ideological fantasy. There is no one thing. It's very funny because, like, if you even... For Israel-Palestine, it's always considered the question uh, was of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Yes, we can solve every (laughs) other problem, but when it comes to the key point, (laughs) Jerusalem, we cannot find an agreement. So the premise even of like the Oslo agreements and all that stuff was if we're going to make progress on everything else, it is strictly speaking meaningless if we cannot confront the problem of Jerusalem. That is how most people thought about peace and conflict, mm-hmm. right? which, which is kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. But that is not actually how it works. It's not that everything means nothing, everything is fine, and that Jerusalem means everything. It's dialectically mediated. It's that everything becomes compressed into this one thing. And so, and I, I don't want to offend anybody here, but the truth is Jerusalem is the, is the part that actually means nothing. Jerusalem is that symptomatic point on which all the other pain points mm-hmm. are concentrated. Mm-hmm. Jerusalem is the name for the problem of Israel, Palestine. And so it's not that the core of the problem exists in Jerusalem per se. It's that all the other things are solvable because they are not Jerusalem. Right. Do you see how that works a little bit? Yeah. And yeah. so Jerusalem is like almost, to use a Lacanian term, Jerusalem is the real of the Israel Palestine conflict. Mm-hmm. It's that excessive, supplemental, constitutive part that gives meaning to the entire constellation in an Adornian sense Mm -hmm. of grievance and pain and historical suffering. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, to go back to Batman vs. Superman. <laughs> so in Batman vs. Superman, there is this fight going mm-hmm. on between Batman and Superman. And there is a point at which they have a moment of ideological recognition <laughs> that drains the meaning out of the contestation. And they identify that one thing that they have in common. Which you know, you're sort of laughing. I is it? I haven't seen the movie. Is it? Does it have to do you know, with it, the, like their mothers have the same name? Mm, mm-hmm. Is that it? Yeah, exactly. Is that really it? Yeah, their mothers have. <laughs> their, <laughs> no, but it's quite. It's quite funny. Yeah. Uh, their mo- Yeah, their mothers have the same name. They're both called Martha, mm. and they suddenly have this moment. And so the cliche mm. would, of course, be that you know every person is the daughter or son of a mother yeah. and we can't dehumanize people <laughs> and of course it's it's more complicated for superman because superman is an orphan let's not go into the whole lore here <laughs> but there's that moment the martha moment which is the moment of suddenly we cannot fight because we both have mothers with the same name and it's a surprisingly complicated and weird plot mechanic because on the face of it, you think, well, is this just like a humanist relativizing argument? Mm-hmm. Is this saying, at the end of the day, we all have mothers, and all our mothers are, in a sense, Marthas, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. is it that, which doesn't seem convincing in any other kind of way? Mm-hmm. Is it that we have here two orphan-like characters who suddenly have been humanized through the relationship? Even that seems like trite and cheesy, mm-hmm. and some people will... <laughs> Martha cor- is their safe word. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Martha's their safe word. Like, it's just the whole thing doesn't make sense. And what's funny here is that what we've created in the name mm-hmm. is we've imbued too much power into right. the name yeah. here. The pow- If you keep the name detached from everything else, it's comical. All names are comical. All names are, at the end of the day, <laughs> auto-referential. All names are, at the heart of it, just a bunch of sounds. <laughs> I know this sounds extremely relativizing, <laughs> but like they don't, they, a name doesn't fracture something. A name actually binds things together that can't be bound. Mm-hmm. A name is the point at which you stop asking why and you start saying it is. Mm-hmm. And here the Martha interrupts the ideology of the movie, or not even the ideology, but the ideological framework of the fight, right. which is the the reason for the fight existing between Superman and Batman. Mm-hmm. And it, it suddenly interrupts. It, like, cuts through. And in a Lacanian sense, this is sort of the anamorphosis idea, which is that the uh, we always come at things from, like, an angle. We don't see things directly. Mm-hmm. The, the, the In a sense, like, the answer to the Batman-Superman confrontation and the fight that can't be won by one side is to insert like a radical sameness Mm -hmm. that drains all the rest of its supposed contestation. Mm -hmm. It's not a good plot device, by the way. I I don't think that like, it's a really odd moment in the film Mm -hmm. itself. Like it's, Mm -hmm. it's, it's worth going back to and seeing just like how, how odd that whole passage is. Is this the film that ha- that was reshot by Zack Snyder? No, no, no. Am I really confused? No, no, I this was a Zack lost... Snyder film. Okay, yeah, yeah. okay. Um, I think it, just... it doesn't really matter. I missed it. I don't think yeah. anyone particularly... I mean, so it's a controversial film because I think many people hate it and many mm-hmm. people love it and mm-hmm. just whatever. Action figures. <laughs> um, the point that I'm sort of leading up to here is, again, mm-hmm. we're talking about the quilting point. Right? We're still talking about the the... Lacanian notion of the plot the couple right. And the idea is that the quilting point here is both arbitrary. It doesn't have meaning in and of itself, but it is perceived as that which gives everything else meaning. Do you see what I mean? And this in a Freudian sense is also what is known as the name of the father. The name of the father is you're living your life in a contestation and a tribute to a father figure. And and it's important here that this isn't actually about the father. As soon as we say the name of the father, we're no longer talking about the father. We're actually talking about the idea of the father, the imagined symbolic relationship to a father. And of course, to some extent today, we would also say that you can have that to a mother. But for Freud, even the relationship to the mother is under the name of the father. That's the Oedipal complex, is the desire to compete with the father for the affection of the mother. Mm -hmm. Uh, And this isn't just about a biological equivalence. This is about, and because the Oedipal complex, like we should do a whole masterclass on Mm -hmm. what parts of it are correct and what aren't and what Freud's revisions of it were. 
But, but again, if you see it from a linguistic perspective, what's important about the name of the father is that it doesn't actually mean anything. It has nothing to do with the father as such. It's the absence of father. It's the mm-hmm. symbolic meaning of father that we internalize and that creates our experience of self through the idea of an unreachable father. This is also why orphans and, and, and uh, people who grew up without fathers talk about their fathers being such a big presence in their mm-hmm. life mm-hmm. precisely because they were absent. Mm-hmm. I think that former President Barack Obama is a good example of mm-hmm. this trope or yeah, perhaps of this of pathology, mm-hmm. dreams of my father, the enormous influence of this missing father figure. And mm-hmm. what where Obama is so clever is that Obama also is quite consciously tapping into a trope, and a trope sounds pejorative, but I don't mean it pejoratively here. I mean it as a something sub-genre mm-hmm. level. Mm-hmm. The trope of the absent father within African-American communities, within African-American writing, within specifically African-American biographies. If you study critical race theory, for example, you will see how that is a recurring narrative feature of African-American biographies. Anyway, I don't mean to generalize here, but like there's the, the name of the father isn't the father. It can specifically be the absence of the father <laughs> in that sense. And so what we have, if you want to be a little bit trite in Batman versus Superman, is we have the name of the mother. And the funny thing is that in a very, very, I know I'm being very sexist here. I don't want to upset anybody, but it's uh, the name of the mother, Martha, is the name of the father <laughs> in this sense. Martha is the name of the father. <laughs> it's that interruption of this symbolic framework that gives meaning to who Batman is and who Superman is Mm -hmm. that is short-circuited because that is what the Batman-Superman moment is. It is a moment of short circuit when it turns out that they have the same name of the father and the same name of the father is Martha. You see what I mean here? Mm -hmm. In a sense. So there's that that hold. Now why am I introducing all of this? Because Again, you know, it's a little bit... What, where are we going here? <laughs> uh, where we're going here is that this is, again, Lacan's argument, is that the quilting point is that which seems to give meaning to everything, but in and of itself is meaningless. Um, I'm going to give you a couple of examples here because I haven't really mm-hmm. given any concrete examples. Mm-hmm. One of those words, quilting points today, is the quilting point of... Freedom. Mm. Freedom means many different things to many people. Mm -hmm. And freedom in and of itself is not a positive entity. Freedom is the freedom to something. It's the freedom from something. Mm -hmm. Freedom does not exist in the world. You can't buy freedom or take freedom home. You can't Mm -hmm. sit next to freedom. Mm -hmm. And increasingly, of course in a very polemical fashion, the invocation of freedom will be used to deny people their rights and to deny people freedoms. For example, what happened last week when trans rights were taken away and was it, was it, which state was it? Alabama, North Carolina, somewhere? It was a bill that was passed to take away transgender rights. South Carolina. So, and the, re- and the justification Carolina. was this, is taking away people's freedom by introducing trans rights. Mm -hmm. We're taking away the freedom of a child to be a child when a child can take gender influencing drugs, like like altering drugs, all this stuff, Mm -hmm. right? And so freedom is invoked very often to rob people of their freedom. Uh, At the same time, freedom becomes a supplement to our way of life. Mm -hmm. Don't question capitalism because now you're questioning freedom. Don't question democracy because you're questioning freedom. Don't mm-hmm. question anything mm-hmm. because you're attacking freedom. And so we have this supplemental, to some extent, illusionary thing, mm-hmm. which is freedom. Of course, a counterpoint would be ask a prisoner what freedom is, and a, f- a prisoner will tell you exactly mm-hmm. what freedom is. Mm-hmm. It is that which he doesn't have. Mm-hmm. So we can take freedom away. We can conceptualize freedom through the absence of freedom but we cannot conceptualize freedom as such. Freedom is pure possibility. Freedom is the, the idea of being able to shape your own destiny and your mm-hmm. own being, as it were. Mm-hmm. This is something really important about rights, for example, is that rights, and, and we can do a whole lecture on this, rights are not something that are given to you, but rights is that which cannot be taken away from you. 
And of course, the irony is that when you say that, rights are not something that can be given to you, right? It's just something that can only be taken away from you. Mm -hmm. That is when we've made rights or human rights into a quilting point, into a point de capiton. That's when we created the point of freedom. This is the problem with the whole human rights universal idea. Yeah, that's a really good example, actually. Human yeah. rights mm -hmm. are those rights that you retain inherently once all of your other rights have been taken away. Mm -hmm. And so you would think that human rights exists in the world as this positive entity under which we have the subcategory of all the other rights. Mm -hmm. But it's the exact opposite. It's that we only have human rights once we feel like all our other rights, our right to housing, our right to education, our right to food have been taken away. Mm -hmm. You and I grew up in the 1990s era of human rights mm -hmm. in which part of our schooling was the idea of rights being ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. Now, it is very popular for people to talk about rights being something particular. Mm -hmm. Some people should have these rights, other mm -hmm. people should have those rights. Mm -hmm. uh, in New York last week, there was a relief fund that was issued I don't know, six, five million dollars, not very much, specifically for illegal aliens. Mm -hmm. In other words, for non-U.S. residents. Mm -hmm. Stuff like this. Anyway, I'm not even going to go into politics. Um, the thing here, mm -hmm. we're talking about rights and freedom. We're still in the realm of things that are considered fairly good, one might say. But it also works the other way around. Mm. Think about anti-Semitism. One of the ways in which the Nazis understood Lacan before Lacan is that the idea of the Jew, capital J, didn't exist in the world. It was a figment of the imagination. It was a construction. A caricature, yeah. It was a caricature, mm -hmm. but more than just a caricature, because here's the thing. If you say, this person is a greedy, I'm just anti-Semitic, this person is a greedy, ugly, malicious, evil Jew, You've created the, these pejorative adjectives that you've attached to Jew. Mm -hmm. And that's already bad enough. Mm -hmm. But what anti-Semitism does is it actually inverts that. And it's not here as a greedy, evil, ugly, blah, blah, blah Jew. In which case, this person could just be a particularly bad Jew. It is that this person is evil, greedy, bad, ugly because he is a Jew. And so that is the point where the idea of Jew becomes the quilting point or like the master signifier. Mm -hmm. Now it's not that you're saying that this is, there are Jews who are this. Mm -hmm. You're saying Jews are universally, inherently this. That is the uh, fascist Nazi inversion that takes place where the Jew, capital J, becomes the thing that doesn't exist the arbitrary, contingent, mm -hmm. manipulated, supplemental nodal point mm -hmm. that colors in what is an, an open signifying chain of what it means to be Jewish. You become determined, your identity becomes determined by this thing. And so that's a very negative example of how yeah. the quilting point takes place. Mm -hmm. uh, it, does that make sense so far? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, and to make it more contemporary here, like mm -hmm. I was reading this thing about Don Lemon, who's a CNN anchor. Mm. Uh, Don Lemon is probably America's most uh, publicly watched African-American mm. news anchor mm -hmm. um, for CNN. And he had a book recently which was talking about race. I mean, not a particularly good book. It was one of those, like, he probably just, like, had a ghost written or dictated. But one of the things he says is that he is done with the discussion of the particular racism. I'm not racist because... I have a black friend. Mm -hmm. I'm not racist because I watch basketball. Mm -hmm. I'm not racist because I grew up. In, he mm -hmm. says, I'm done. Mm -hmm. You live in a racist society and your particular attitude towards race is not of the importance here. Yeah. In fact, the reason our society continues to be racist structurally mm -hmm. is because on the level of individual responsibility, very, very few people step up and say, yes, I am an avowed racist. A racist society consists of people who consider themselves to be non-racist. That's how it works. The universal structure 
isn't a tally of all the individual racists. And when we get rid of all the racists, we'll not be racist. It's that the individual disavowal of the problem of racism constitutes racism today. Mm -hmm. And what, what Don Lemon intuits here is that this is actually, I mean, maybe he doesn't go that far. This is how all meaning works mm -hmm. in a sense. We have these things, these nodal points, these mm -hmm. concepts that stand in for the floating empty signifiers right. that gives meaning to all the other stuff. Mm -hmm. And so where does Zizek come in here to end? Mm -hmm. Zizek's theory of ideology mm -hmm. is simply that learning to identify those nodal points doesn't mean that you look beyond them. It's not that you wake up from the illusion of them. It's that you realize that secretly the nodal points are empty. That the things that seem most meaningful in our life, whether it's a name or the idea of freedom, mm -hmm. strictly speaking, are empty. And that doesn't mean that they are meaningless, but they are so meaningful precisely because they are empty. And because they're empty, they're being filled in. Mm -hmm. So there they're is like an, a vacuum. There's yeah. an active process, mm -hmm. which is a process of recognition a process of awakening, mm -hmm. a process of agency, of individual subjectivity, which is you are not the passive recipient of meaning and of the status quo, but that you can contribute to the filling in of that space. And that this is why, for example, in Marxism, for Marxism, political awakening is not, I was one thing and now I am something else. I was this and now I went out and became an activist. Political awakening is that you've changed the perspective on who you already were mm -hmm. and you are no longer it. Mm -hmm. You've become a different person, not because you've shifted into a new being. Mm -hmm. It's because you suddenly realized who you were already, but you disavowed that. It's almost like to make a really crass comparison here. Like you think about sexuality, like mm -hmm. many people talk about their sexuality when they're young and they say, the question is always, when did you know? Mm. When did you know you were gay? When did you know we were trans? And, and many people respond, they say, I always knew, but I hadn't gotten to the point where I formalized right. that knowledge. Mm. And that's what Marxist awakening is, is it's saying, I always knew, but I didn't actually acknowledge it. And when you acknowledge it is when you actually ironically start changing what the status quo is. You start realizing what your historical situation is. You start realizing how your particular experience and reality filters in into the perceived universal reality. Remember, we started this class by saying that when we talk about something that we think is a private thing that only I feel, most likely other people feel it too. And if you can articulate why you're feeling it, mm -hmm. maybe other people can start thinking, oh yeah, that's what I feel and this is how I feel it. And so mm -hmm. to go back to the very beginning of this lecture, we talked about the three most beautiful words in the human language are, I need help. And the reason that I need help are the most beautiful words in the human language isn't because of like some like savior complex or some pathological whatever. Mm -hmm. It's because the I need help is the recognition that you are not alone and that your particular subjectivity is not a void, that you are connected to the world and that the reason that you feel alone is because you have not found a way to give a name to what it means to be together. Because the experience of aloneness is the experience of detachment from the world. It's not actually being alone. It's feeling disconnected. Mm -hmm. It's feeling alienated from the world. And the process of realizing that the condition of being in the world is learning to understand and embrace your own alienation from the world is a profoundly emancipatory moment. Yes. And that's ultimately what Zizek's critique of ideology is, is it's not to say let's knock it all down, let's see through the illusions, let's be cynical and smug. It's to say, when we start understanding how ideology functions, 
that is the exact point at which suddenly ideology seems malleable and human agency returns and human subjectivity returns. And we don't feel like we're at the mercy of like a child saying, why is it like this? Mm -hmm. And the mother saying it is because it is, is at the end of the day in our own hands. And it's the process of reformulating that problem to the point that the unthinkable becomes thinkable that we're in the individual agency of humanity lies. Because the downside of this, the Nazis did the unthinkable. The reason people for a long time didn't believe in the Holocaust wasn't that the crime was too small, it was that the crime was too big. And this is exactly how it works. If the crime is big enough, people won't question it. If the revolution of individual emancipation is big enough and ambitious enough and world changing enough, it will not be questioned. Do not be afraid of large scale transformation of the imagination of what it means to be alive. And to end on that note, Pandora's box, the Pandora's box that we have already opened is the Pandora box of machine learning mm. and automation. Mm -hmm. And the biggest challenge to human subjectivity will be what happens within the next 100 years or 50 years, maybe even 20 years, when machine learning becomes so powerful that it completely reframes the Cartesian subject and what it means to be alive. And there is a wall that is coming. It's the wall that the chess masters faced when they were playing the deep blue computer. Mm -hmm. It is the wall of autonomous creative learning. I mean, deep blue wasn't machine learning yet. Mm -hmm. It was problem solving, mm -hmm. but autonomous non-human thought and the ethical prerogative to understand and shape the meaning and perseverance of human agency in that world. And that isn't to say some kitschy thing of robots are going to take over or something. That's not what I'm saying at all. What you think is the status quo right now is not static. The it's status, already changing. It yes. is already changing. Mm -hmm. And you are not at the mercy of that. Mm -hmm. You can find your individual agency mm -hmm. in it. And the critique of ideology, ideologie critique, is the exact process of taking back control and acknowledging that your individual agency is tied to the world and that there is something worth fighting for in that world that goes beyond you being at the mercy of the world. And that is the nodal point of this lecture series. Why, why we talk about ideology? What is the point of ideologie critique? And so every other lecture in this class, the first six weeks and the <laughs> next six weeks are filling in those blanks. But this is the heart. This is the crux uh, of this project is why talk about ideology? What is the critique of ideology and what is at stake? And what, I, what I've always said in these classes is we teach because it matters. Our slogan is think like you mean it. Sincerity is a gift. And the critique of ideology isn't about a diploma. It's not about what can I do to enhance my productivity. Mm -hmm. It is about facing the profoundly existential question of what does it mean to be in the world and what can I do to fulfill my potential in that world? And fulfilling your potential starts, the last thing I would say, fulfilling your potential starts with a very simple question, which is, what is meant by potential? And how can I define potential as opposed to living up to what the world thinks my potential is? That is the question. Reformulating the problem of human subjectivity. And we do that by means of the critique of ideology. And ideology, if I can remind you one more time, is the science of ideas. The science of pure form. The science of the ideal. The science of reaching for that which cannot be symbolized, that is the sublime, 
The sublime is that which cannot be named. It is the nameless name. It is the signifier without the signified. And on that note, we will end. Because for Lacan, as for Zizek, the definition of ideology is a signifier without the signifier. Okay, thank you very much for this class. I know we went a little bit long. Is that okay? I was, I was preaching a bit there, wasn't I? Yeah. No, I loved it. I know we started a bit late. We're gonna, thank you for being with us. Thank you for joining our class today. Yes. It's been our pleasure to teach you, as always, uh, on this Monday morning. Uh, we're going to be going live on Discord and live on Clubhouse for the seminar. If you would like to join us, please feel invited. If you'd like to leave us a little financial donation to participate in this class, or if you'd like to access the masterclass, mm -hmm. which is going to be on Freud, Marx, and Zizek. Mm -hmm. uh, if you'd like to download the audio for this class and for every class we've taught, as well as the study guides and definitions <laughs> and reading lists for every single class that we've taught, please go over to www.patreon dot com dash Jenny and Julian. I'm going to type that in one time here. <laughs> www.patreon.com dash Jenny and Julian. And if you're already a patron, thank you very much. And please consider upgrading. And if you can, please consider upgrading to our subscription tier, which is going to be sent out this month. Yes. Very first one. Yes. Limited edition, exclusive <laughs> yes. publication and notebook and stationery. The first time we're doing JXJ merch. Yes. That is going out this month, so get it while you can. <laughs> yes. Uh, oh, and on YouTube, I think people also want to have the Patreon typed out. I don't know how to, how do we type I, on YouTube? I don't know how to type on YouTube. Let's I see can never can... really figure it out. Okay, so we'll see. If you go to our Instagram, you can find the <laughs> link in bio. This is great. Uh, if someone can type it, actually, Pablo, Pablo, if you could type it into the YouTube, that would be wonderful. <laughs> www.patreon.com dash Jeneline and Julian. It has been our absolute pleasure to teach today. Yes. You can find Julian at Sublime Hysteric on Clubhouse. And that is where we will be. That's exactly. where we're going to open the room. Yeah, I'm going to go to the bathroom. <laughs> Sounds and then good. We're going to launch you very on Clubhouse. Much. Yeah, we're going to take, a, we take a few talking. minutes break. But um, yeah, See you bring your questions, bring your thoughts, bring your uh, and ideological critique over. I exactly. Really look forward. Thanks very much, Pablo. All Thanks, right. everyone. Talk take soon, care. Guys. Mm -hmm.